Hello neighbor, I'm Robert Burns and welcome back to another edition of Sound Off Louisiana. And I trust that all of you have enjoyed a very happy Easter Sunday. Uh, and it's good to be back in the swing of things. And before I start our main feature today, I'm going to take just a few moments to do what I'm going to call some housekeeping. Uh, and that will bring you up to speed on some of the most recent features that we have done. Well, let me begin with the Stephen Street feature, as most of you will recall. Uh, there was to be a hearing uh, about whether or not all of the evidence that uh, Mr. Street has gathered in the uh, Nate Kane uh, situation uh, is to be suppressed. Uh, and I mentioned back when we did that hearing that uh, there was to be a, I'm sorry, when I did that feature, that there was to be a big hearing uh, later that week, on Tuesday of that week. Uh, that, that hearing was held in federal court in Alexandria, uh, and the judge has taken that matter under advisement, uh, which means he did not rule in the actual day of the hearing, and instead will be contemplating the matter going forward. It has to be pretty uneasy to Stephen Street to know that, hey, I couldn't get a ruling from the bench. It's probably going to cause him, at least if I were in his shoes, a few sleepless nights. Uh, but we will certainly await uh, that ruling from the judge because it will have a profound impact uh, not only on that case, but it will have a domino effect on a number of other cases. Again, I don't know why Stephen Street uh, couldn't, he's a CPA, I don't know why he couldn't be a belt and suspenders guy and just follow what the statute said to do uh, and, and only let the IG office serve in a backup capacity. That's certainly what they ought to be doing. Speaking of which, we will have another feature coming out for you before this week is up. It is going to be huge regarding a filing entailing Stephen Street's office that was made today in 19th Judicial District Court. We will have that feature out for you before this week is up. You have my word on it. Uh, also, with regard to the Pat Cooper feature that we, we, we uh, brought to you. He was the former superintendent of the Lafayette Parish School System. Uh, I told you in that video that I would be getting the additional uh, invoices that they did not supply me with with regard to Seals Hammond uh, during the period of, of uh, late 2014, early 2015. I did get those. That resulted in a much higher figure. Uh, approaching 1.8 million dollars. We had put out 1.5 and that's the way I will leave it. Uh, and I'm happy to report that Channel 10, KLFY, uh, went forward with the feature four days after our feature, uh, focusing on that same thing. We have added a link to that feature so that you can see the KLFY feature. And I'm happy to say that's twice uh, here recently that uh, the Lafayette mainstream media, specifically KLFY, uh, have piggybacked and ran on features that we have been investigating. I certainly view that as a positive sign. I'm very happy about it. Uh, I, would, I wish the Baton Rouge area media would, would take a cue from that because much of the material that I present to you has involved quite a bit of research uh, and I believe is newsworthy, much more so than some of the things you're reading in The Advocate, which has largely become uh, literally a sports publication that bounces in a few news stories here and there. But I have told you the primary reason for that is that John Georges is the owner. There's actually some reference to that in the feature we're going to have today, but I'm not, I'm not going to get into it because the feature we're going to do today is so, so broad and so deep that there just won't be time to cover everything. Nevertheless, I'm very happy that uh, the KLFY has followed up on that feature. Today, uh, one, one, one other thing, uh, with regard to the, I'll bring you up to speed on the Kathy Durbin situation. Uh, the, as, as would be expected, and as I had told a number of people following this particular incident, uh, the Attorney General's office has filed a peremptory exception of no cause of action, uh, which is almost a given in, in the vast majority of civil lawsuits. Uh, I'm not going to go into everything they assert in stating that uh, Ms. Durbin has failed a state of call to action other than one element, uh, which I believe is a very powerful and strong uh, argument. Remember we told you about uh, these illegal appointments to uh, the State uh, Police Commission, that they were not following the Constitution with regard to getting letters from these various colleges and then the governor chooses from among those recommendations from the presidents of these various universities. Instead, Governor Edwards was merely just making the appointment like that, whomever he wanted. Uh, and you may recall 
uh, the chairman of the gaming commission who I was uh, offered a little uh, cash to refrain from posting negative articles uh, had apparently uh, Ronnie Jones we're talking about I've done past features about that uh, having allegedly told Miss Durbin or she he was not aware that he was on speakerphone at the point that he said it but it's now in the pleadings that he that uh, that, that the governor's office had told her to shut the f up okay well what they have asserted in that a supreme for exception no cause of action is that our client that being the police commission didn't violate the law okay it's not the police commission who makes the appointments uh, I think that's a very compelling argument and I, in my opinion the judge is going to have little choice but to grant uh, the peremptory exception now whenever a peremptory exception is granted you have 30 days in which to cure uh, any defects that's by statute you have to be provided 30 days to cure any defect the obvious cure there is to go back and name governor john bell edwards as a defendant in that litigation uh, this will be an opportunity for jill craft who is known for having a huge set of balls uh, this will be an opportunity for her to step up to the plate uh, because i believe that's about the only way you're going to cure uh, that particular uh, exception and uh, name the governor as a defendant in the litigation uh, naturally, that will no doubt cause Jeff Landry to salivate because, as we've seen, he, he is none too shy about taking on Governor John Bell Edwards in court. I'm not going to suggest that that was why they provided that exception, but uh, it's an interesting little uh, curiosity there. Uh, it, will, it will be interesting to see, because the pleadings stated that the governor had done this, uh, the governor's office ought to have been on notice that it that it likely would be sued. Obviously, they weren't in the original petition. The reason that's critical is because the prescription period has now passed. Uh, it's going to be a little tricky to try to get the governor in at this point in that litigation, uh, but I believe it can be done. Uh, I'm not a lawyer, obviously, but there are some nuances. It's not as if uh, it was not known that even in the pleadings it was alleged that the governor did these things, so I do not think it will be too late to add him as a defendant, but obviously that will be for uh, those that make the big bucks, the judges and the lawyers to make that determination, assuming Joe Kraft is willing to go down that road. Now what we're going to talk about in today's feature involves what I can only describe as more uh, either incompetence or lack of regard for common decency in the practice of law. I don't know any other way to describe it. But what is so aggravating about it, and, and we, have told, we have talked ad nauseum, and I'm going to continue to harp on it because nobody really understands or nobody really grasps how much money this is costing us as taxpayers. The incompetence of someone like Stephen Street, and the feature won't be on him today, but we're about to move to who it is under. Uh, <coughs> and the conduct that these lawyers engage in and the fact that the massive amount of money that it costs us, okay, now, who are going to be the, well, first of all, we've all heard the old saying about, well, it's not really an old saying. A lot of times, it's, it's no big secret that an attorney doesn't really like his client, uh, okay? You're stuck with a client, and a lot of times, you really don't have a lot of love for that client. Be that as it may, your obligation is to provide legal, the best legal counsel you can for that client, Otherwise, he has no business being your client, uh, and you're to let all of your personal feelings go aside, and there's something called a, a attorney-client privilege, uh, and you, the, the attorney is supposed to honor that. It is a very important foundation of our entire legal framework, honoring attorney-client privilege, okay? We're going to talk about two attorneys today. <laughs> That I, the, the bottom line here is we're going to talk about incompetence but, but, and, and basically shady legal practices. Uh, but in this particular instance, it could be that we as taxpayers will actually benefit from it. Okay, And it sure is nice to know that we can benefit from something as opposed to paying through the nose for such incompetence as has been so often the case and is most assuredly the case with Inspector General Stephen Street. Now, let me just say this. Uh, Attorney General Jeff Landry, in my opinion, is doing one more hell of a job uh, with regard to defenses that he is putting up for 
these civil lawsuits that we hit, get hit with. And I want to make one thing clear, and I want to make it very, very clear. Jeff Landry inherited a mess, okay? And he inherited a mess from two individuals, both Bobby Jindal and Buddy Caldwell. Buddy Caldwell had one of the biggest fiascos in the CNSI litigation I've ever seen in my life, okay? Uh, and Jeff Landry, that matter was, that, that civil litigation had not been resolved at the point that Jeff Landry took over. Very, very wisely, I think Jeff Landry sought to get that mess settled ASAP. All right, we're going to have a follow up feature in coming days. You know, once that all ended in Louisiana, that wasn't the end of the story. It was plenty went on in Maryland, and we're going to bring you up to speed on that because it's pretty well wrapped up now, and, and uh, you're going to find that a fascinating feature. It will further prove, though, why I have not hesitated to say Buddy Caldwell is the most corrupt individual I have ever met in my life, okay? And you got to realize Jeff Landry inherited that office from him. Uh, the other individual that is responsible for the mess that Jeff Landry inherited is none other than our former governor, uh, Bobby Jindal. You see, at the point that Jeff Landry took office, there were a lot of cases that were outstanding out there having to do with people that Bobby Jindal had appointed uh, that just engaged themselves in absolutely outrageous conduct. Uh, and so lawsuits were filed by state employees, understandably with good reason. Uh, and then Jeff Landry is left with no other choices, not as if he's got a choice in this matter. As the Attorney General for this state, he is obligated to provide the best possible defense to these civil lawsuits to we as taxpayers, okay? That's his job. He may not like his job, just like I told you earlier, attorney may not like their client, but they, have, they are obligated to do the best possible job they can. We're basically his clients as the taxpayers, okay? Now... We're going to talk about two attorneys today, one of whom you will see pictured up in the profile, and that being J. Arthur Smith. Now, J. Arthur Smith uh, has frequently sued, uh, he, he, he kind of specializes in, in suing governmental-related uh, employees and so forth, uh, but here's the deal. Brian Dijon was, well, let me just first say this. I have never covered this case ever, and so that's going to make it very difficult to cram all this into one feature, but we're going to do it, okay? Uh, you have heard me frequently talk about Murphy Painter, the fact that that litigation has dragged on for seven years. There was yet another hearing today. This must be about the 18th. The judge is getting fed up. That's very obvious. God only knows what the legal bills are in that whole Murphy Painter situation. It was a situation where there again, Bobby Jindal fires without without due cause, uh, Murphy Painter over this $300,000 exclusivity payment. I'm not going to get off on all of that other than to say the legal costs are just absolutely staggering. Well, as if that wasn't bad enough, the gentleman he appointed, a former senator in the name of Troy Abair, was an absolute, unequivocal, unmitigated disaster, okay, by any objective definition. By, and, and, and look, this is not just me saying this. And you're going to get that sentiment from anybody, okay? Uh, and, uh, and unfortunately, for, for the plaintiffs in this lawsuit, we're, or plaintiff in this lawsuit we're about to discuss, uh, the attorney who at one time represented Troy A. Bear harbored such ill will and anger to him that he's probably going to screw this whole case up, all right? And that's unfortunate for those plaintiffs. On the other hand, it's it's good for us as taxpayers, all right? And Jeff Landry is doing his job in exploiting just such ludicrous actions on the parts of attorneys. Now, what is that of which I speak? Well, to give you a little bit of history, there were three gentlemen that worked at, at ATC, Charles Gilmore, Damian McDowell, and Larry Hingle. These are all black gentlemen, and there can be little question that, that Bear was on a crusade to discriminate against blacks. Uh, I think anybody pretty well knows that. Uh, and so he was actively trying to get these gentlemen fired, uh, and, and, and it, was, it was a bad situation. Well, understandably, these attorneys sued. Okay, as I said earlier, we get left holding the bag for this stuff when we have irresponsible appointments like what Bobby Jindal made. There's a reason that I've told you to be a cold day in hell before I would ever support Bobby Jindal, and you're gradually starting to see why. 
But at any rate, that trial was scheduled to take place late July of last year. And even though I've never reported on it, uh, I did go to attend to see the trial. Well, I could tell there was problems. I, I didn't know what the hell was going on, but everything went into recess. It was an extended recess, and, and uh, Hart Smith, that's J. Arthur Smith, he likes to go by Hart. I asked him what was going on, and he said, well, right now they're talking about not allowing uh, a witness that we've got to get in. He said, and without it, it's going to gut our whole case. Those are his words, not mine. Well, who was that witness? All right. That's what we're going to talk about. The witness was Brian Dijon, okay, who had at one time served as legal counsel for Troy Hebert over at Alcohol and Tobacco Commission. All right. Now, because it was looking like that this gentleman was not going to be allowed as a witness, and we'll go into why in just a moment, because that's the crux of the whole feature today, talking about a violation of that attorney-client privilege. It's Canaan number four in the American Bar Association's Canaan's, all right? Well, it turns out that Art Smith, literally days before this trial, literally days, decides he's going to subpoena Mr. Dijon. Mr. Dijon, in an air of cooperation, simply walks over to Art Smith's office and he picks up the subpoena. He was even questioned, was this one of these little friendly subpoenas? Now, here's the important thing. The Attorney General's office is not, they they're not given the courtesy of being notified about any of this, okay? And I'm gonna make a football analogy. It's kind of like showing up on game day of an NFL game, so, oh, by the way, we got this star running back, he's gonna be on our team. Oh, really? We didn't, we didn't see him on the roster. Oh, yeah, we claimed him off of waivers last night. He'll be playing. Mm-hmm. And so, naturally, the Attorney General's office objected strongly to this witness, who was Brian Lejeune. Now, let's, let's take just a moment. We're going to give you exhibits. Let's, let's take a look at what Mr. Lejeune's attitude about Troy A. Bear was. Now, this is his former client, all right? And we're going to give you text messages, but for purposes, you're going to see the entirety of the text messages going back and forth between Brett Tingle, who is the, who is the plaintiff in the lawsuit we're dealing with now, not, 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 not to do with the three African-American folk that sued Bear. We're going on to another suit because I don't wound up getting settled. All right. Now, but, but this, this, this is what. And you're going to see it as the first one. And I'm just saying that to say we got the backup text to support it, but I'm choosing to only put in front of the camera this portion of the page of some pleadings. And what the pleadings are, well, let me get, I get ahead of myself. Let's read, uh, let's read this. this. This was filed by the Attorney General's office. It says, their motives are clear. Dijon was a disgruntled former ATC employee who expressed very negative feelings about Hebert. Remember, that's his former client. Well, it says his former client. To the plaintiff in this case, including calling Hebert an, quote, idiot, a, quote, jackass, unquote, a, quote, sorry sack of shit, unquote, stating that Hebert should be in a jail cell, telling Tingle to, quote, give Hebert an extra kick in the ass for me, unquote, and encouraging Tingle to, quote, help everybody else bust that bastard's balls. Does that sound like your heart was a little bit of an ill will? I would say that it does, okay? Uh, and so this is the witness, Brian Dijon, that the Attorney General's office is saying, uh-uh, we don't want him testifying against these three black uh, agents for ATC. And there's another blogger, I'm not going to mention his name, many of you will be familiar with him, and he covered this. He, he has covered in, in pretty excruciating detail this whole, these whole episodes. Um, in fact, he covers a lot of lawsuits by uh, J. Arthur Smith. And uh, the blogger put out a post when this case was settled, and he said that well, gee, the state spent $300,000 in legal defense claim, and then they settle a case for a quarter of a million. Now, that was for the uh, three the three plaintiffs combined. And I'm going to tell you something, a quarter of a million is a bargain, all right? When you look at everything that Troy Bear did, a quarter of a million dollars is one hell of a bargain 
for us to get off in settling the case. But the, 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 the thrust of that article was that, well, why didn't you do this a long time ago? Spend $300,000 and you settle the case for $250,000. Well, the answer is very simple. And that, look, Paul Hardy used to say as he closed the radio show, and that's the rest of the story. Well, I'm going to give you the rest of the story. Okay. The reason they didn't do it a long time ago is because it was the actions of this gentleman, Mr. Dijon, that made it up and that gave them the ability to do it. All right. They said, you're not getting this witness in. And by Art Smith's own admission, that would gut our case. This star player on the roster that you find out right before the game, he's going to be ineligible. And so now they have to come hat in hand and say, can't we work this out? Can't we work this out? And I commend Jeff Landry for minimizing the cost to the taxpayers in agreeing to settle the lawsuit for a quarter of a million dollars because I'm going to be blunt with you with the egregious actions of Troy Hebert. Uh, I think a jury settlement would have been far, far larger. Thank you, Jeff Landry. And I guess in a roundabout way, thank you, Brian Dijon, and thank you, Art Smith. For, try, for engaging in this kind of outrageous conduct. Now, if you're going to play the game, play it according to the rules. If you wanted this gentleman in as a witness, do it the right way. Give the other side notice, schedule depositions. You don't. This is not Perry Mason where you go in there, whoa, have we got a surprise for you? It doesn't work that way, okay? And I commend Jeff Landry and his staff for jamming them to the wall on what they tried to do here. All right? So that's what has happened. Now, in those, in those texts that you will see, between Mr. Dijon and Brett Tingle, who is the plaintiff in the current litigation, you're going to see a few other things. I'm not going to go into them. Uh, you know, there's talk about... A, a, a gentleman named Young who was a lobbyist for ATC and the problems that he would pose. It, if you're reading it and you wonder what, what's being referenced there, Mr. Young was, was charged by federal authorities about having distributed videos of, of, of young kids having sex with donkeys, okay? That's just not something I'm here to report on. It's sickening. Um, I will give you a link for a post that Scott McKay of the Hayride made back when all this broke. But I said that only to say this. If you're reading that in the text, that's what that has to do with. I didn't want to just give you these texts and then you wondered, you know, uh, well, well, what is this? But I, I have no desire to, to discuss those type, type of matters. Um, so here we are. By the way, Art, how did Brett Tingle come about to be a plaintiff? Well, Brett Tingle was assisting the black uh, plaintiffs with their litigation. And so Troy Hebert wasn't about to stand for that, so not long after Mr. Tingle had had a heart attack and was recuperating, trying to, at least in his home, he gets notice that, hey, you two are fired, or you are fired, whatever the case. So he fires Brett Tingle. So Mr. Tingle naturally files a lawsuit. Do you see how much one incompetent Egotistical employee in the name of Troy Hebert can end up costing this. I mean, it is a staggering number, and that's just one, okay? We've got gobs of them out there. All right, now I'm going to move on because I do want to cover, uh, and we'll have it blown up for you too. This is a series of texts between Mr. Gilmore, who was one of the plaintiffs uh, in that case, that I told you about that had to be settled for a quarter of a million. And Mr. Gilmore, the fact that you didn't get any more money than that, I think you need to look only at your attorney and Mr. Brian Dijon as to why you got so little money from it. And again, thank you, Jeff Landry, for exploiting their weakness. Uh, that, that, the, the actions of Smith and Dijon are inexcusable. That you think you're going to go in there and pull this Perry Mason event and stick us taxpayers. No. Jeff Landry did a damn good job in defending that litigation, and he's doing an even better job here. What I'm saying, he's doing an even better job in this current litigation. Now, that may not be good news for Brett Tingle, you know, and I do have, I certainly have empathy for these folks that have been wronged that way. But you got to sit back and realize we as taxpayers, I, we're getting freaking fed up 
with all of the legal expenses and, and engage the result from irresponsible actions like Troy Abair. So while I'm sorry for Brett Tingle, I have to commend, commend Jeff Landry for his stellar defense of this. Remember on the other one? Remember on the case for the three attorneys? In that one, he was seeking to have a key witness not participate in the trial. I made the analogy of football, like we got the star halfback. Oh, by the way, we claimed him off waivers last night, but he'll be in the game. Oh, no, he won't. Well, Jeff Landry rack, rack, racketed, it up, racketed it up a notch in this trial. We're talking about the same action, all right? The same egregious action on the part of J. Arthur Smith and Brian Dijon, all right? Now Jeff Landry has filed a motion, and that's what we've given you the link for. Every, all these documents are being pulled from that motion. And by the way, ATC just piggybacked off that motion, all right? He says, I'm taking your quarterback this time. Last time I got your halfback. This time I want the quarterback. He is calling for J. Arthur Smith to be disqualified from being involved in this case. I'm pausing because that, that is one more drastic action. He is, he is calling... He believes that this action on the part of J. Arthur Smith is so egregious in such blatant violation of ABA Canon 4 that he's calling for the judge to take him off this case. Now we're going to give you the filing that J. Arthur Smith filed in opposition. I will admit to you this is a very drastic action that's being called for. I don't know if the judge is going to grant it or not. One thing's for sure. The judges, you'll never be able to blank something like this out, all right? I believe Jeff Landry's arguments are strong, and I believe nothing short of disqualifying J. Arthur Smith from this case would remedy what has happened here. The violation of attorney-client privilege that Brian Lejeune owed to uh, Mr. Abair as, as sorry Everything that Mr. Dijon said about Troy Hebert may very well be true, and I would have a right to say it, okay? I'm not really going to argue that what he said isn't true in his characterizations of Troy Hebert, but he had an obligation to recognize as his former counsel, he had attorney-client privilege that should not be divulging some of the things that would be sought to be divulged, and that attorney-client privilege does not terminate once you're no longer representing me. It continues on in perpetuity, and the only one who can release you from that is the client, Troy Bear. And what do you, be? well, we know Troy is not going to release him because it's Troy Bear who's raised hell about this, and I, quite frankly, I don't blame him. Uh, but there are some other interesting texts. I'm going to go through these hurriedly because I don't want this to be too long of a video. Uh, but these are texts between Brian Dijon and Charles Gilmore, who was one of the three plaintiffs in there. Uh, well, these were around October 12th of 2012. Now remember, Jindal was still governor back then. Thank God he's not now. Here's Charles Gilmore. Hey, Brian, this is Gilmore. Uh, this is my personal cell. Did Larry inform you we filed racial discrimination against Abair? Dijon. No, but I've been waiting for those to start. I've heard that a lot of the blacks are offended by the pre-civil rights movement decor. I was concerned about that when he first started transforming the place into a set for African pickers. He also tends to offer incentives the same way plantation owners offer them to the quote house negroes unquote, if you will pardon the expression. I wish there was a better way to say it. I tried to warn him that through Jess through Jessica, but she that would be Jessica Starnes. We'll get to her in a moment. But she got defensive and blew me off. All right, we're gonna skip down. Mr. Gilmore then said, Damien, Larry, and myself filed. We're trying to contact anyone with information about this matter. Let's skip on down to Dijon a little later. Oh, and I understand that the IG is already investigating TMH. That's initials for Troy A. Bear. Okay, the Inspector General's on the case, young man. Woo! We can go to town now. Remember, this is October 2012, and I told you, I've told you, I've given you overwhelming evidence that Stephen Street is nothing but a pat, that he is nothing but a lackey for the governor. So I sure hope that there was no 
uh, celebratory when they found out that the whoo, our illustrious Inspector General, the strongest backbone of anybody I've ever met in my life, sarcasm in full on full display there, folks, that he is investigating. Whoo, boy, 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 we can go to town now. Inspector General Street is on the case. Also, Jessica is telling people that she is so chummy with the industry that they want her to be the next commissioner. God help us all if that happens. Now, let's skip down a little further that Mr. Dijon says, By the way, make sure your attorney knows that Jessica was promoted from attorney one directly to attorney three, but she didn't meet the minimum qualifications. She hasn't practiced law a day in her life. She was hired as an administrative processor. I'm sorry, prosecutor, which is not an attorney position. Jessica has never been in a courtroom as an attorney. She doesn't even know how to prepare a simple answer. I know because BLT, that's short for Brant Thompson. Uh, I know because Brant Thompson asked me to train her. She has no clue how to practice law, but she got promoted to a three without having the minimum experience. She also got about a $30,000 raise. Troy Bear promoted her to give her a raise. Meanwhile, he punished everybody uh, with any experience and knowledge. Sounds like Troy Bear, all right. Let's go a little bit further here. He continued to say, by the way, Jessica was the legal whiz who advised Murphy Painter during his misuse of NCIC. He didn't trust me, so he talked to Jessica. Probably the only reason she wasn't charged is because her uncle is Bodie white. Now folks, many of you looking at me wonder how in the hell we could have ended up with a mayor like Sharon Weston Broom, and she is an unmitigated disaster, okay? And I would submit to you, it's because of her opponent, all right? You could not have possibly picked a worse opposition candidate to Sharon Weston Broom than Bodie White, okay? And that's how you ended up with Sharon Weston Broom. And I hope the Republican Party learns a key lesson from that, especially as the next mayor's race comes up. All right, but I digress. I should, let, I should have let Brant Thompson fire that bitch when he wanted to. I thought she could be rehabilitated, but she is just an opportunistic power junkie. She's now turned on Murphy Painter, who hired her to gain favor with Bodie White. Jessica couldn't get a job anywhere else because she has no clue. So Murphy Painter hired her because he probably would not have been reappointed otherwise. Don't know if that's true or not. I'm just reading what Mr. Dijon said. Let's continue on with Mr. Dijon. These are all texts to Charles Gilmore, one of the plaintiffs. Also, remember when you were chosen as bailiff for the hearing with Joe Long on the place in St. Helena Parish? Bodie's niece told me you were chosen because you are black. Troy Abair wanted to have a black agent behind him to create an image that blacks support him. You were plain clothes and head of Region 1. Now, I'm not sure who did that. I don't know whether it's Mr. Dijon or Mr. Gilmore because they don't break these things up. The next line says, that's one miserable MF. They're referring to Bear, of course. I'm not sure who, which one is saying that, so I don't know if, I, that's why I didn't draw a, a initials out to the side. I'm not sure whether that's uh, Mr. Dijon or Mr. Gilmore. Probably they both share the same sentiment. There are probably a lot of people that share that sentiment about Mr. Bear. Problem is, Mr. Dijon, as his previous attorney, needed to kind of bring some of these feelings in check, because they're now out there for, wide open for everybody to see. Let's continue on. Again, this is Dijon. By the way, you know how Troy Bear got there, don't you? Neither party wanted him, so he couldn't run for re-election. He wants into the Republican Party because it's growing. That made him a perfect fit in Jindal's mind. He can't say no to anything or Jindal will blackball him. A uh, Bobby Jindal? No! No! Say it isn't so! Like I said, Mr. Dijon makes some great points, but as an attorney, as a former attorney for Troy A. Bear, all right, that made him a, this guy used to represent A. Bear, but this is really unbelievable when you think about it. That made him a perfect fit in Jindal's mind. He can't say no to anything or Jindal will blackball him. As long as he's in Jindal's back pocket, Jindal will protect him. Well, the next line, there can be little doubt that that's Gilmore, and he says, we'll see about that. And so, 
uh, down at the bottom it says, Bodie's niece is going to do whatever she has to to protect Troy Bear, short of taking the fall himself. I heard that from her. When you depose them, do it on the same day and do it back to back so they can't discuss anything in between. Ask them under oath why you were chosen. They're not expecting that. And a quick little wrap up here. Bodie's niece is your key. She has zero qualifications aside from being a senator's niece and being a tall blonde female. And she had her pay doubled while y'all were all demoted and transferred and treated like shit. Sorry for some of the language in there. I'm not making an effort to clean it up. Uh, that's pretty Hit Hitler-esque. All right, that's going to, except for these, I, I want to cover these texts between J. Arthur Smith uh, and uh, Mr. D uh, Dijon, literally at the eve of the trial for the, for the, the, the black agents, uh, because at that point, Mr. Dijon had gotten himself into a mess. Uh, and they're over there fixing to conduct this trial and now he's having to, to <laughs> everything's coming out and it's not looking good for him. So Mr. Smith says, all right, all right this is Art Smith, counsel for Charles Gilmore, uh, please provide me with the name and contact info for your counsel because what's now happened is Dijon got in there and, and, and did these disastrous acts, and so he's now going to be advised, hey, you better get your own counsel here, because you may be in some deep doo-doo, okay? And so Dijon rep replies back, and this is on July 24th. This is right on the eve of the trial for these three gentlemen. I'm working on counsel and would update you ASAP. Then he followed it up. I'm still awaiting appointed counsel from the Office of Risk Management. And that goes to what I'm saying. Once again, we've got to pick up the tab for these kinds of irresponsible acts. So now we've got to drag another attorney in. Okay? I mean, it just gets worse and worse and worse. I've spoken with my personal attorney, but he's out of the country this week. He advises me to plead the fifth out of an abundance of caution on anything improper or illegal Bear directed me to do. I don't see any issues in regard to self-incrimination because I didn't actually do any of the improper or illegal things Bear directed me to do, but I must follow the advice of counsel unless and until anything changes. Well, that's probably one of the smarter things you've said, Mr. Dijon. If you had just followed ABA Canaan number four and, and maintained your attorney-client privilege, uh, you probably wouldn't have gotten yourself in this mess for, for, to, 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 to start with. He then says, I may be forced to limit the questions I'm willing to answer that may brush against any kind of attorney-client privilege. Wow, now's a fine time to realize that. As improperly as they may be invoking the privilege, the judge will have to rule on any issues regarding attorney-client privilege before I will address any questions along that line. Finally, if Jessica Starnes, that's, that's Bodie White's niece that he's been harping on, if Jessica Starnes is called as a witness by either side, we should discuss some impeachment material. We should discuss some impeachment material. Okay. Uh, a little bit further down, as he, they're literally over there in court expecting him to show up. I'm not going to read the rest of the text to, to uh, give you the details of him showing up, other than to say I was there, as I told you, I knew there was this lengthy break. Uh, and they said, okay, he couldn't get the attorney he wanted, so he gets John McClendon. Boy, you're seeing John McClendon's name pop up more and more and more and more. Many of you saw he's also representing um, um, uh, Baton Rouge Police Officer Salamone uh, with regard to this, this latest incident, um, you know, with, with regard to um, oh, the gentleman. I can't believe I can't think of his name. He was selling the CDs. He's been in the news constantly. And I, I can't believe I'm drawing a blank on his name right now. But at any rate, uh, big heavy set fellow. I just cannot think of his name. I'm sorry. Uh, but at any rate, he, he, uh, uh, Mr. McClendon is, is representing Trooper Alton Sterling. It came to me. <laughs> sorry. Sometimes you have these little outages and it takes a while to come back to you. But uh, he's representing uh, Mr. Salamone or Officer Salamone in that matter. But at any rate, I'm going to wrap this feature up in saying that, you know, it's easy to sit, sit back and criticize Jeff Landry for this and criticize Jeff Landry for that. And we have another blogger, many of you have probably figured out who I'm referencing, uh, who is just lambasting the living hell out of Jeff Landry. But I'm here to tell you that 
and, and the bottom line is not only are the attorney general's hands tied about being able to go out and prosecute certain things because the district attorneys have original jurisdiction, but you have to realize what his role is. His role is, and he's to do it to the best of his abilities, is to try to minimize the outlays to us taxpayers in this litigation. And I'm going to tell you one thing right now. Sometimes it causes internal struggles with me because I hate to see employees get screwed over, and so many of them are getting screwed over. But at the same time, he has an obligation to provide the best defense that he can. And fortunately, J. Arthur Smith and Brian Dijon gave him the avenue. They handed it to him on a silver platter. And I commend Jeff Landry for exploiting it in the settlement with the three black gentlemen so that it would minimize the cost to us. Doesn't mean I don't have sympathy for those three black gentlemen. What Troy Abair done in that in that in the entire operation of that agency is reprehensible, okay? But I'm not, you know, Jeff Landry has a job to do. And he may not he may not even like doing it himself. That's the difference between an attorney that's going to do the best of his ability and what we're seeing from Mr. Dijon here, okay? Um, it's, just, it's, just, it's just a difference in, well, I'll let it stop at that. But, but I commend Jeff Landry on this filing uh, to have J. Arthur Smith removed from this litigation. And I believe that would be the appropriate action. Uh, it probably may be a little bit of a long shot. I certainly will follow up and we'll we'll give you the report of whatever the judge decides but this kind of egregious conduct by Art Smith and by Brian Dijon is inexcusable okay and in the majority of instances it usually comes back to cost us a lot of money it looks like in this case we know it saved us some money on the settlement uh, with regard to those three gentlemen it's probably going to save us Good bit of money with Mr. Tingle. Doesn't mean I don't have sympathy for Mr. Tingle. Uh, but I'm going to tell you what, these legal costs are getting staggering. All right. And so I commend Jeff Landry for exploiting shady legal practices and, and unequivocal uh, just ignoring ABA canon number four. So from Robert Burns, thank you. Jeff Landry, and thank you for turning in to tuning into this sound off feature. We look forward to bringing you this next little feature that we're going to have about a major filing made today involving Stephen Street. Thank you so much.